Hey, hey, it's the Productize Podcast. My name is Brian Castle. Thanks for tuning in today. Got a really good one talking to Kiri Masters. She's the founder of Bobsled Marketing. You're not going to forget that name. It's, it's hey, the Bobsled team, right? Um, so they are a marketing agency for Amazon sellers, and they help Amazon businesses basically optimize their whole product funnel and give them a push, if you will, as, as she said, um, you know, going with that, that bobsled metaphor there. Um, so yeah, we talked all about her journey from quitting the job to starting this consulting business just herself and within months, bringing on a few people. And now three years in, she's got a team of 21 people all running uh, marketing services for Amazon sellers. It's, it's pretty impressive. So we talked all about delegating and building systems and processes and the whole sales process and marketing using content marketing involving your entire team in the content side um, selling a book on amazon as a lead generation tool that was a really interesting part of this conversation so yeah a lot of really good insights here from kiri um, you're going to enjoy this one so without further ado here you go here's my conversation with kiri masters of bobsled marketing All right. I'm here with Kiri Masters. Kiri, how's it going? I'm great. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for doing it. You know, I've been a fan of your work for a couple of years now. I've been seeing your your stuff come across the DC Dynamite Circle, and you've been on the Tropical MBA podcast a couple of times. So. That cult that we're both yeah. part of, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yep. So yeah, you run uh, bobsled marketing. Um, you know what? It's probably easier if I just let you kind of give the uh, intro of what it is, what you're kind of focused on. Yes. So I started bobsled marketing back in 2015 as a solo consultant, helping consumer product brands to manage their Amazon channel and helping them launch products on Amazon, manage all the operational aspects of it. And how I got into um, doing that was I had my own product brand and I launched those products on Amazon and I sort of, I knew the lay of the land enough to sort of start selling my expertise to other businesses. And today, Bobsled Marketing sort of grew out of myself as a solo consultant to a team of now we are 21 people mostly full-time based in the US and Europe. And we work with larger brands at this stage, five to 500 million in revenue typically. And we offer a range of services all around helping those brands to manage and grow their Amazon sales channel. Awesome. Um, I'm just curious, how'd you come up with the name, Bobsled? (laughs) Yeah, so (laughs) it was, um, I think that a business name is important and also not important at the same time. Like it shouldn't hold you back from starting a business. And if anyone is really deliberating too much over what they should call their business, they should just, you know, start with something, which isn't a really positive way to frame up why I called it Bobsled Marketing. But it was the intention behind it was that we would give your online marketing a push. And if you think about Bobsled, Bobsledding, and I've never found a really like succinct and clever way to say this is a tag line so we kind of have skipped over it up until now in our branding you give uh, amazon sellers businesses a push i really like it <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, i think i saw like a photo on your website somewhere you guys had t-shirts like bobsled team very cool so you, you talked about how you kind of got into this you were selling products yourself on amazon do you still do any of that or like how like heavily were you focused on just being an amazon seller before you got into you know running a marketing agency yeah, so the brand I started was it was back in 2013, sort of as a creative outlet of my day job, which was uh, in at J.P. Morgan Chase up with a strategy job and then a commercial banking job. So it was pretty intense, but I wanted to do something on the side even then. So I started this DIY craft product brand called I Like That Lamp, and it's DIY kits and materials for people who want to make their own custom lighting. So it's about as niche as you could get. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I sourced these products and I created a website on WordPress and I did everything myself, shot these tutorials with my camera at home on the weekend, showing people how to make their own custom lighting. And everything was built on WooCommerce and then I put some stuff on Etsy and that worked out well. And I was very resistant to Amazon for a long time because mm-hmm. I sort of had this opinion at the time, this is back in like 2013, that Amazon was not a place for branded products. But um, yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like a Etsy type or selling through your own site kind of product. Yes. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and that's why you know, I just thought it wasn't really for me or, or my brand. But after hearing about it a little bit more through all these e-commerce podcasts I listened to, I just decided to give it a shot and I saw a very dramatic sort of increase in sales on Amazon fairly quickly. And so then I just started spending more time figuring it out, figuring out how the algorithm worked and what was important or the operational side of things. So by the time I was looking to leave my job in 2015, I sort of looked at my skill set and the e-commerce company wasn't making enough money to support me full time. So I just looked at what I could do consulting wise. And that was one skill set that I thought this is this is pretty marketable. I could, I, I know of a couple of companies I could approach and pitch, pitch a consulting gig to them. That's really how it all started. Yeah. So what did it look like when it started, when you had those first clients, like what were you doing for them? Like basically like optimizing their whole Amazon sales funnels, basically? Yeah. So a lot of it is about, um, for a lot of brands, they don't have their products listed on Amazon or they might be listed by other entities, like other sellers who have acquired inventory from them and put a product listing up and they may not be optimized really according to Amazon's search algorithm or just the way that people want to interact with and look at product pages on Amazon. Like people want the product description to answer their questions. People want to see lots of images that explains how the product works. People want to read reviews from other users. So it's really all of those things to optimize each individual product listing. And then there is a lot to layer on on top of that in terms of paid search advertising and running promotions and setting up coupons and subscription programs all within the Amazon platform, as well as all the operational stuff that is really unsexy and things like where to put the barcode on the product and what kind of packaging you need and how to make sure that your inventory isn't rejected by Amazon when it gets to their warehouse and getting approved to sell in different categories. And I mean, there is just a boatload of information that you need and the rules are changing all the time and there's new programs and there's changes to policies. So it's very, I think the reason why this service is valuable to brands, even very large brands with dedicated e-commerce channel managers, <laughs> they still need... Um, Somebody who really knows the nuts and bolts of, of Amazon, basically. Exactly. Yeah. And really a whole team that's sort of getting in there with getting their hands dirty every day because there's stuff that changes every day and we're able to take lessons from this category and apply it over to this category. And there's not that much that we haven't seen before, but at the same time, there's something new every week that we have to adapt to. Yeah, every little market and niche is probably just reacts differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, like, so, you know, taking back to that period where you were leaving the job, going out on your own, you have this little side business on Amazon, the, the products that you were selling, but you need to start this consulting business. I know that there are a lot of people listening who are kind of in that boat or they're around that stage. How did you actually go about getting those first customers and what did you like pitch to them? How did you get into those conversations? How did you even price your services? And and even like the things that you just listed out in terms of the things that you could do on Amazon, like that, that sounds like you're solving a lot of different problems for different types of stages businesses. Like how did you approach that when you had like basically zero customers? Yeah, well, I will say that this is coming up to almost exactly three years in business now. So it's been and as a business owner and a leader, you know, working very long hours and putting a lot of time and effort into this. So I will say that those were three very, very long years. Yep. <laughs> but um, so to answer your question, pricing initially was zero dollars <laughs> um, because you need to develop credibility, you need to have some case studies, you need to know what kind of problems you're solving to people and what kind of package they want. So there was, in that first year, it was like 100% experimentation. And I was lucky with my first client because they were actually a client of mine at the bank and already knew me and trusted me. And so that was a pretty easy sell. And then the next few clients were a lot harder without a lot of case studies and sort of experience to point back to. So what I did was I actually worked with a lead generation company who approached successful projects on Kickstarter. And so we would look at like projects that had successfully raised over, I think it was 75000 for a physical consumer product 
um, for a consumer product. And so this lead gen company, they would, they would get the email of the creator of that project and send them a semi-customized email to say, congratulations, you've raised this much. Have you thought about selling on Amazon? Here's why you should do it. And so here's why I said I worked for zero dollars. I worked on like a success basis. So I'd only charge like 15% of revenue or something like that. I, I forget what the exact model was. So it was kind of like, if you don't make money, we don't make money. We're motivated for success. And I would never, ever do that right anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so tell me how, how did that work out and like, what were the lessons learned there? Some successful partnerships came out of that. We worked, there was a brand that we worked with for two years under that model and they were, they were great. And then there was a lot of spectacular disasters and people who just, you know, we would work our butts off for three months and start seeing results and then they wouldn't pay their invoices. And um, yeah, winners and losers. So I think we just kind of scraped by. Well, I guess that sort of problem can happen no matter what the model is, right? Like clients just not paying. That's true. I, I mean, I, I don't mind sharing this information. I had a client who shirked on $10,500 worth of unpaid invoices about six months ago. It just got settled. I had to pay a lawyer $1,000 and I got $2,500 back from the client after threatening to take them to court. Wow. And at that point, the lawyer was like, look, you shouldn't take them to court. It's not worth the time. It's going to cost a lot more than $10,000 in legal fees. So that is really distressing when you think I need to have like more than 10 grand in invoices to actually do anything about that from a legal perspective. Even if you have a good contract, even if you have a lawyer, they don't work for free, you know? Yeah. And even when you're doing everything on like credit cards through Stripe and they're signing up for a subscription or whatever it is, like even then, I mean, you know, cards fail or they have a debit card that's not funded and then they don't get back to you and Dunning and all that fun stuff. And it's just, it's a mess. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, what the story that that you're telling around productized services really helps to mitigate that as well. So you have, you know, you're collecting a payment every month or whatever the period is then then you have a lot more of a reliable revenue stream you you know if someone goes by more than a month without paying then pretty much going to to cotton onto that and and be able to pause their service or whatnot yeah and and it also sets an expectation like they know exactly what they're buying they're budgeting for it they know exactly what the bottom line dollar amount is going to be after x number of months hopefully they're planning for that right um i'm curious like so You've been running this business for three years now. What do your services kind of look like today or how did they evolve from that early iteration? Did you ever go to like a fixed model? Like this is a package that you can buy or how, how does that kind of worked out? Yeah, so it evolved from doing sort of all performance-based fees to having like a, a monthly retainer. And it's evolved over time to really offering four main services which are billed monthly and build on sort of every project that we do is customized to some degree because it's a very different workload to be to be launching or managing three products as opposed to 300,000 so you know obviously there's there's a big difference with resourcing and like software requirements and stuff like that so everything is priced up sort of according to the project and according to what the level of workload is relative to that. But between then and now, there was definitely a lot of experimentation with things like, do we charge a retainer plus a commission? And that's something that we would consider in in some instances now. And what else did we try? Oh, like if we were going to do a launch like launch a new brand on Amazon, we'd say it would take three months and it would cost like a fixed amount of money. But that was always an issue because there'd be scope creep or things didn't happen on the timeline that we expected because there was, you know, inventory issues or shipment, you know, some kind of operational thing. So it's without getting into the weeds too much, you have to really understand all the things that can go wrong with the project and build that into your like contract or the expectation that's set or your timeline. And even after three years and doing hundreds of, of projects at this point, we still 
kind of experiment a little bit with pricing and contracts and things like that. And um, some of those pay off and some of the, those don't. And you just have this like ongoing feedback loop of thinking creatively about how you as a service provider can meet your clients' needs profitably so that your company is sustainable and they're happy and they get what they want and, and it's valuable to them as well. I could see how focusing on Amazon sellers and people selling physical products, I could see how that could add a whole layer of operational like delays and headaches when you're doing marketing services for them. I mean, I know a lot of listeners and people in, in my world here come from like the web design background, like building websites for clients. I mean, I've been doing content with audience ops and there are delays there just getting clients to give us information or, you know, we're waiting for their feedback on something or approval. But yeah, I mean, like production or inventory delays, that, that adds a whole other layer to it. So that could be tricky. Yeah, I mean, on a similar note to something like web design, we're, we're waiting for product assets from clients or sign off. And then there's some creative, dis- creative discretion involved. And as I'm sure you can appreciate, whenever that happens, then you might go to the client and say, and they've given you a style guide and this is how we refer to our products and, and all that. And you go back to them with a product description copy and they say, oh, no, that doesn't, you know, that's not our brand at all. <laughs> there's a, there's, even in something as cut and dry as what you imagine inventory and PPC and stuff like that is, there's, there's always going to be some degree of disagreement about the creative execution. Yeah. So what does your team look like? Or like a typical client engagement? Who's working on that? Like, it sounds like you have a mix of like PPC experts and copywriters and like what, what all goes into a client engagement basically? Yeah. So it depends on the type of project that we're doing. If we are just managing PPC and that account will be managed by a PPC manager who has a, a right hand person, a specialist who's more junior and they will be supporting that manager to deliver reports and analysis. And the manager really sets the strategic direction and manages the relationship. Um, If we're doing a more holistic channel management plan for that client, then they'll have what we call a project manager, which might in other companies be called an account manager. They're the person, again, who's responsible for the relationship, setting the strategy, accountable for the milestones, accountable for results, sort of the person that has the most accountability in that relationship, then they're also supported by a specialist and an assistant and um, work together with that PPC manager. So that sort of operations organisation is obviously the bulk of the company. We have a human-powered service. We try and use software as much as possible to get accurate information and make our processes efficient and do the best job that we can with some degree of software and automation, but really we offer a human service. So that is the vast majority of the company of people who interact directly with clients or play that supporting role. Yeah, very cool. I mean, it's it's really impressive how you've gone in three years, you know, just you up to, you said 21 people all doing these different jobs, these different tasks, taking on these different roles. Uh, again, I know there are a lot of people listening who are trying to figure that out, like just figuring out how to go just beyond them or just beyond them and a partner. Like what was that first step? Like early on when you had those very first clients coming out of the job from Chase, was it basically you doing everything? And like, when did you start to delegate? So it was me um, for a good six months or so. And then my husband joined me in the company. He was in marketing as well. And we were starting to get those leads from the lead gen company. And so we were both doing the same job, sort of catch as catch can, doing sales calls, delivering projects, sending invoices, like just everything. And uh, around October of that first year, I uh, put a job out there for an assistant. I was looking for basically like a VA that could just sort of help me manage the actual projects and put reports together and manage customer service and all the things that we needed to do for our clients. I didn't know at the time that the person that I hired, well, I did know, but I didn't appreciate how critical this would be later on. The person that I hired was like a operations manager at a school with 16 years of experience in the school system and eventually had sort of her most recent job was as a vice president principal essentially like a head of operations for this school and seeking just a complete change of pace wanted a 
home based job was you know came uh, I don't know what her thought process was when she responded to this job exactly, but it was something completely different. That was exactly what she wanted. That's amazing. I mean, there are so many people with these incredible skill sets, you know, super competent, but coming from completely different industries and they just really value that work from home thing, having that flexibility that they didn't have before. Yeah. I mean, there are a bunch of people on my team who kind of come from that sort of transition and it's, it's huge. Yes. Well, what ended up happening was that that person, Julie, is now our operations manager. She has 17 people reporting to her, not directly, but, you know, through a team of managers. So she, I guess, unexpectedly for her and for me, just her role kind of like tripled every year as well. And she just turned out to be qualified to do pretty much everything that we needed to do. So looking back, it was just this amazing stroke of luck and if I was going to try and turn that into a lesson for anyone or some kind of takeaway. Like hired that person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well I think the temptation is especially when you're starting out and you're, you're barely paying yourself any money. You can't you can barely think about paying someone else like a, another professional of professional salary and everything that comes with that. But as much as you can um to think about where you want your company to be and if that person is going to be experienced or ambitious to help you grow the company because I count that as an enormous factor is the fact that Julie was not only there from the beginning to do pretty much every job in the company, but she was the right person to actually go from being the doer to the manager to the leader. Yeah, that's huge. And there are a lot of really great people who are like great technicians that can do their their job really well, but then getting into a management role or even like a growth or leadership role um, is really a whole other story. But yeah, I mean, it's super valuable to find somebody who you can kind of promote from within that way. So, you know, throughout that whole process, obviously going from just you to, you know, partnering up with your husband and then bringing her on as your first real hire. Obviously that's a big milestone, but like beyond that, like, were there any like other key milestones where it went from, okay, you're doing a ton of work to now there's somebody who's basically taking that off of your plate. Any like key milestones in that journey that you can look back on? Hmm. Um, let me think. I think along the way it's been necessary. The biggest example, <laughs> which is pretty concrete, was when I took maternity leave and it was my first child, so I, I wanted to plan for three months. And that was really a catalyst for promoting Julie to operations manager, whereas previously she was managing client, you know, uh, she was a project manager. So that was that was a big move and really just planning for not being available at all for three months. And it was kind of stressful to get all that figured out, but it really helped to prove to me and the other people who were responsible for running the company while I was away that it was possible. And it brought in a lot of systems and sustainability into the company that we didn't have before just because it was just easier for me to do keep doing stuff myself rather than trying to figure out how to delegate, how to pay all the contractors or, you know, like those things where it's you'd prefer not to give up control for whatever reason or it's just too fiddly to actually delegate it so you just keep end up doing it forever and, and it just ends up being like four hours of your week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just so huge to have an event like that just give you the kick that you need to, okay, I have no choice. I have to, like somebody has to take care of this because I'm going to be completely occupied. Yeah, it's, it was very freeing as well. I came back and the business had been doing better than when I was managing it. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't take it personally. It was, yeah, it was, a lot of times that, that stuff just, it, it works out for the better. And I mean, I remember like about, this was about a year ago, I took a month trip to the Philippines with my family and the plan was for me to work from there. And then of course our Airbnb like had zero internet, not like slow internet, but like did not work at all. Oh, no. So I had to like kind of get like a half an hour in working from the lobby every day, but that was, that was like about it. So that was kind of a big kick to, I mean, I had a team in place at that point, but it wasn't, there was still a lot that kind of relied on me to give the final say on stuff. And then it, it was just a couple months later when one of our longtime managers 
like she gave me the kick that I needed to be like, all right, Brian, I think it's time we really removed you from the day to day because literally people were confused. Like, all right, do I ask Brian this question or do I ask Kat this question? Like who has the final say? And I mean, that has just been so, so valuable to kind of, I'm still like, she'll delegate stuff up to me when necessary, but most of the time it's, you know, get that stuff out of my inbox and everything just runs smoother. Yeah. And, and imagine what, she, I mean, she must have been a little bit nervous coming to you to give you that feedback, I'm sure. But for her, I mean, it's like also a big step up in her career and her responsibility. And I think by trying to protect our company and do everything ourselves, kind of being a little bit selfish, like we should give people an opportunity to step up. And sometimes, sometimes they'll mess up, sometimes they'll make a different decision than you would, but that's all part of them growing and, and them learning. And sometimes, sometimes they're right and you're yep. wrong. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and they have more information than you do and, and all that. So awesome. So let's get into more of like the marketing and sales side. Uh, before we get into the marketing, I, I am curious about how your sales process basically works. I noticed that, you know, going through your website, basically all the call to actions are pointing to a consultation form. So what happens after that? Like somebody fills out the form, you get their information. What's next? So we have two de- dedicated sales people and they will set up a consultation if it makes sense. I mean, sometimes we get inquiries where it's just, there's, it's very clear it's not going to be a good fit. So we will always at least respond and say why and point them in the direction of someone who could help or some resources that could be helpful to them. But because of all the, we, we do a lot of content marketing and that's been the case right from the beginning. So we get a lot of quite a lot of leads I think about 25 30 a week so that is actually a really big volume to deal with when you have when you're trying to coordinate consultations and following up with people and sending them proposals and following up three times on those proposals and answering questions about the proposal (laughs) so there is um, and like I said we customize pretty much every project that we work on so then there's a lot of thought and negotiation that goes on between the salesperson and the operations team to say, you know, to kind of negotiate a price and say, is this going to make sense given the workload that we expect from this and what we've done in the the past? I'm curious, like maybe I missed this on your website, but like, do you, I think you're not showing pricing on your website anywhere or like starting prices or anything like that. So like, do you deal with qualifying leads before you book a consultation and all that? Um, not in terms of throwing a price out there because it can vary so much. And I, that, I thought about that idea a couple of years ago just to kind of keep things really simple and try and productize a little bit further and say, this is our price for this, this is our price for that service. But in actually trying to figure out what that would look like, there are just too many variables which come down to which country, like which marketplaces do they sell in? They could be selling in Europe and the UK and the US or you could have any number of different products. And even the way that we categorize what is a product is kind of confusing because, you know, I could be selling women's purses and have three different styles and seven different colors within those styles, but how much work do each of those variations need? So I guess one little detail I noticed was that like your consultation form has a question, like how many like employees do you have? And I think it starts at five or 10. So it's like, if you're a solo person right there, you kind of get the impression like, okay, this is probably not for me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So to answer your question probably more directly, there is some kind of screening that happens when people first reach out. So, you know, from there, we would set up a call if it seems like we would be able to help them and explain what we do find out about them and then it sort of starts the whole process of what kind of you know how would we help you what kind of service would it look like very cool and so your, your sales people just basically take care of all of that the scheduling the doing the call following up doing the proposal yeah often we'll we'll be doing uh we'll we'll have some companies approach us which want who want us to audit what they're already doing or tell them what they should be doing right so they they're looking to implement it themselves but they really want some experts looking into their account saying what they should do or like planning a launch or something like that so it ranges from sort of doing those paid research projects right through to like a ongoing contract 
So it's during that process, we're trying to figure out together with the client, what are their needs? What are their goals? Does this make sense? And that can take months, that can really take months, especially with those larger companies. They have to, they have to, it might be the marketing manager reaching out and then they have to get approval from different people within their organization. So we do another call with them. Right. And just the discovery, just to figure out what, what's all involved for you guys in order to put together a, a proposal, right? Yes, exactly. So how about on the marketing side? I mean, obviously you guys are doing a lot of content. Um, I want to hear about that. I mean, one thing that stuck out to me, I was browsing your, I guess it was your team page. It looks like everybody on your team or most people on your team are writing on the blog. Yes. And that's, that's been very deliberate to help separate me from the company. Not that I'm like, I'm obviously very much involved. But I didn't want it to be a situation where people come to Upside Marketing or the content's written by me, so they only want to work with me. So in order to do that and give the people on the team credibility and help to sort of develop a relationship with prospective clients even before they've spoken with them, they have their own personal brand. So everyone from the managers to the PPC guys, they're all writing articles. All of the client managers, so the, the project managers and the PPC managers, not so much the specialists because they typically interact less with the clients and they're not really the ones sort of driving the, the ship with the relationship. But all the people who are directly sort of accountable for the results of that project, they're writing content. Got it. You're one of the very few companies that I've seen kind of do that effectively where they get all their different team members heavily involved in writing blog content because, you know, I mean, most companies who try to do that, everybody on the team is just so busy on client projects or working on a product or something, or they're just not writers, you know. Um, how do you manage that? And how have you kind of instilled, I guess, like the motivation and the systems to get people writing on the blog? Yeah, I would say it's not perfect. We don't have a perfect system. But you're totally right. Not everyone is a writer and some people find that idea very stressful, <laughs> like asking someone to jump on a sales call with you. Some people, are, that is not their preferred way to spend half an hour. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> so cognizant of the fact that everyone's going to have varying levels of interest and, and ability with doing that. And so for us, it looks like coming up with the, the topics that we want to cover, which are always sourced from what clients are asking, what prospects are asking, and probably could do a little bit more keyword research, but we've never done that in the past. It's just, it's just all driven by what questions people are actually asking us. So we identify all those topics for the next two months, planning out any further than that is pointless. And then we would assign those topics out to different people on the team based on their experience, based on if we have a new team member on board, we want to give them an opportunity to share their knowledge pretty quickly. And then they will either put their thoughts down within that content brief, which at this point in time, I still prepare that content brief and say, you know, this is the angle, this is what we want to be talking about, here's some resources. And then that subject matter expert will put more of, sort of examples or anecdotes or flavor into that and that's when we (laughs) work with a writer to really get all that together because those project managers some of them are great writers and they're interested in writing but you can't make those presumptions especially if you want everyone on the team to be contributing equally you don't want to constantly be going back to that one person on your team who likes writing blogs yeah. Oh, okay. So you have like people on your team are basically the experts and they're providing all the insights and the examples and stuff, but then you go to an actual writer to write up the piece. That's the secret. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. <laughs> so I also noticed you have a book on Amazon. I guess you launched that a little while back. Tell me about that. Like what went into releasing the book and how has that basically worked out for you? Yeah, it's been really helpful. Um, at the time of publishing it, there was a lot of books written for people who were starting out with like building a business around Amazon and that was their sort of side business. There was a lot of content and quite a few books out there that talked to that audience. There wasn't a whole lot of books out there for established brands who this book is not so much written. It's not written so much for the entrepreneur as for the marketing manager, the brand manager or the sales manager of a bigger company. 
So it was very instrumental in building credibility for me and the company. I think that's a really fine line to tread like we were talking about before. If you're the only one out there producing content and if your name is on the book and if your name is in the articles, it just becomes harder and harder for you to separate yourself from the company and give other people the like the respect and accountability that they should have if they're dealing with clients. Right. But still, if you're doing a book, like it, it should come from one person's voice. Like, I, Oh yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't want to read a, like a 200 page book from an agency, like a, a collection of different people. You know, I'd want to hear somebody. Yeah, exactly. I think there's some really good examples of people with a very, very strong personal brand who operate within a company and they help to actually build the brand of the company. So I think someone like Sheryl Sandberg, who has her own brand, but you know, whenever you think of Sheryl Sandberg, you know that she's Facebook. And if you like Sheryl Sandberg and you like what she stands for, then you probably have a slightly better opinion of Facebook than you did if she wasn't sort of someone who was so powerful and vocal at that company. Or someone like in my industry, maybe this is a reference that's too obscure, but there's a, um, a marketing professor at NYU and like a strategist at this agency his name's Scott Galloway he's pretty famous in like the retail consulting circles but Scott Galloway is from L2 Consulting and you know that's he, he's got his own brand and he's on all these podcasts and, and papers and he's a professor and everything but he's still Scott Galloway of L2 Consulting so it's definitely possible to give your people that kind of platform within your company and help you know, them to develop their own personal brand, but still within the context of your company. Yeah, absolutely. So do you find leads coming directly from readers of the book? Yeah, I I think in putting the book together, I was pretty conscious to not drop my pers- my direct email address as many times as how to contact Upside Marketing if you need help with this. You know what I mean? Like, you, otherwise, I think you as an author, you could end up with a lot of email that you'd be dealing with. I've always wondered about that, like, I like doing the Amazon book thing as a lead gen, and I don't mean a low quality ebook. I mean, obviously, I think yours is like two hundred pages or something like that, and you know, really focus on that audience. So, but like, are there any like I don't know, like tactical tips if you are launching a book that is related to your business and it is there to kind of serve as a credibility and lead gen asset, like? And I've, I've just ne- really never done that. I've never really gone the Amazon route for a book. So like, is there a limit to how much you should mention your own company in the book or in the intro or something like that? Or like, yeah. how do you handle that? Well, the way that I did it was you kind of want to bookend at the beginning and end and then sprinkle throughout what the capabilities of your company are. And so when you think about like the beginning of a, a presentation or a speech or and a book, you want to establish credibility. And so what credibility do you, Brian Castle, have with content marketing, for example? Well, you run this content marketing agency and you've worked with 50 different companies to do this. So I think I know what I'm talking about. You know, like you're establishing that credibility through your company. You're setting that up right from the beginning. And then throughout, you're talking about strategies and tips and stuff like that. And we found that this has worked and um, we found some of our clients have had success with this. So you're always bringing it back to what you've done as a company, even though it's written. Yeah, like it's useful information, but it's still coming from a place of authority. Yeah, exactly. And then at the very end, what I've got in my book is a couple of case studies at the end. Um, And before that is like genuinely helpful advice about choosing an agency that can help you with your Amazon needs. And it's not all geared towards you must work with bobsled marketing. We're the only ones who know what we're doing. You know, it's not like that. It's this is what you should look for when you're choosing a consultant or an agency. And I'm rewriting it now because just within a short period of time, everything's out of date. (laughs) And I might even take that one step further and say how you should decide between working with a solo consultant and an agency because there's very, there's differences in, Frankly, a lot of the people that reach out to us, we say, go work with a solo consultant. It's going to be a better fit for you. So if you're giving that genuine advice, that's like people know that obviously you have an interest in getting clients, but if you're 
genuinely helpful and you offer alternatives and you explain pros and cons in a genuine way, they will trust you. Yeah, absolutely. So last one here, you know, right now we're here at the beginning of 2018. What are you kind of looking ahead to? I'm, I'm just curious about like, because things are changing so fast and where are these trends kind of going? I guess both on Amazon, you know, maybe without getting into the weeds too much there, but but also just marketing services in general. I, I know that you, you know, you, you network with a lot of other agencies and people doing marketing. So like, what's kind of changing right now in, in 2018 that we have to kind of think about, that you're thinking about? Yeah, well, in, in my sort of niche specifically, there's a lot of big ad agencies finally getting into offering an Amazon service, and that's really driven by Amazon's own moves in the advertising space. So there's some there's varying predictions on this about how much market share they will take, but a lot of analysts, equity analysts, are saying Amazon's going to be like the third competitor in the Facebook, Google paid search war. And so a lot of those really big agencies that are, you know, represent global brands and they're publicly traded companies, they're finally kind of waking up and saying, oh, our clients need help on Amazon. We better do something about it. So for me personally, seeing a lot of press and signs of consolidation coming down the pipe in the next one to two years so that is puts an imperative on me, like to ensure the sustainability of my company, I kind of need to prepare for more competition from the top and more competition from the bottom because there's lots of people leaving Amazon, starting their own practice. There's a lot of consultants out there. So I anticipate pressure coming from both sides and that is the case in any sort of growth industry. You, if you're in a growth industry, other players are going to want to get in and sometimes that pressure is going to come from very, very established big companies with deep pockets that don't really care if they're making a lot of profit on that service. So, I mean, it, it's kind of intimidating. Yeah, and, and when those big companies come in, they're, they're just offering it as like a, a way to get the customer and sell them other products and services. Yeah, Exactly. They're doing it for cross-sell. They're doing it to retain them as well. So if, if you're a big ad agency and you don't have that service and your client goes to a competitor for that service, they could end up getting their claws in and, and stealing that client. So they want to be own as much of that relationship as possible. So that's what I'm seeing personally. And then yeah, generally speaking with marketing, anything that becomes a popular strategy or channel, you're going to have more of that competition over time. And obviously the dust settles and people kind of find their place in the ecosystem it's probably more like in those really aggressive growth categories that you see the most carnage. <laughs> I just feel like in, I, I've seen a little bit of this trend in the last couple of months where I just feel like marketing your marketing services or even marketing any sort of product, it comes down to personal trust now more than ever. You know, like there, there's always going to be marketing funnels and, and ads and even just like SEO optimized content, like that stuff will bring in a level of traffic. But at the end of the day now, like there are so many options to solve every individual problem that if... What was the last like service that you bought for your company? Why did you choose it? Yeah, exactly. Probably because I know the founder or I know, or I'm in a community with them, you know? Um, I was just talking to Jordan on my other podcast about this. Like I'm a customer of Drip for email marketing. I've been a customer for, I don't know, three years or something like that. But Drip does exactly the same things that ConvertKit does, that ActiveCampaign does, that Infusionsoft. Like you could do all the same things. You know, they're just designed a different way, but they do all the same stuff. But I go to MicroConf every year and I listen to their podcast every week. And it's like, yeah. that's kind of the obvious choice. That's so funny because I'm sure all, all the respect in the world that Rob doesn't care if you're a Drip customer. You know, like not, not him. I mean, it must, it must be nice him to know that but it's not like ryan's subscription to drip is going to make or break drip you know? or you would have a really awkward conversation with him if you ended up moving to convert kit but it's kind of like that that's what ma that, that's what matters you have this affinity to that company for whatever reason and um also the, the cost of changing it is pretty high in terms of time and exactly energy and stuff yeah yeah 
so yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a good place to kind of, you know, wrap it up here. Um, Kiri, this has been really awesome. I know that there are a lot of folks who are in similar shoes as to yours or coming up kind of behind you in different niches there. So yeah, I know this will be really valuable. Obviously, uh, Bob Sled Marketing, we'll get that linked up in the show notes. Um, anywhere else where people can uh, connect with you? Yeah, I would love if people have an interest in the retail space or e-commerce, I have a podcast called E-commerce Brain Trust. And that is at least the first season. We're focusing on Amazon and a lot of really nerdy, nerdy stuff around that. So if you've got an interest in that topic, then um, definitely check that out on iTunes. It's called e-commerce brain trust. Very cool. Yeah. We'll get that linked up as well. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Kiri. Thanks, Brian. Hey, did you know that you can get all of these show notes and highlights and links for every new episode sent straight to your inbox by going to productizepodcast.com and sign up for the email list. Yep, it's all there. And while you're at it, a five-star review on iTunes always helps the show find more listeners just like you and me. Okay, that does it for today. Late. <laughs>